consider subscribing or checking out our Patreon to support us. May 14th, 1971. A woman is found dead after being strangled and sexually assaulted in the Vitebsk region of Belarus, a seemingly random killing that none thought would lead to 35 more. October 29th, 1971. A woman has a noose thrown around her neck, but manages to repel the attacker, placing her hand between it and binding the attacker's finger. And thanks to school children in the area, they both help scare off the attacker. The police are approached about it, but they are said to have written off the attack as not being that serious. The killings would continue, even one on the same day as the failed attack we just mentioned. The method was always the same, sexual assault followed by strangulation with improvised means, sometimes a belt, sometimes a scarf, or other items. Authorities began working with the local voluntary people's Viruzina, a Soviet neighborhood watch of sorts, as well as local volunteer police to solve the growing number of murders. The authorities did not believe the murders to be connected. Similar to the case of Chikatila, the investigation was seriously hindered by the authorities' insistence that serial killers were a decadent capitalist phenomenon. As stated in Murder by Numbers, the 100 most deadly serial killers. The murders are separate incidents, the police insisted, not connected at all. And so off they went to arrest a suspect, four in fact, over a 14 year period, one of whom was executed. It was an arcane and an inept stance, one that allowed a killer to massacre at least 33 young women in 14 years. Local prosecutors' desire to continue closing 100% of their cases led to four different people arrested and or convicted of the murders they did not commit. Framing and forced confessions were commonplace. By the 1980s, a young investigator by the name of Nikolai Ignatovich began investigating. He strongly believed the killings of females near motorways in the regions as not being separate killings, but committed by one entity or person. The police knew the killer's car was red due to witness reports. They would question those in the area with red cars. Their lucky break came when the killer made a fatal error of leaving a handwritten note at a murder scene. The killer became concerned about capture and seeked a way to throw the new investigator off his trail. In order to curb the investigation, he began writing letters signed, The Patriots of Vitebsk. The first to a local newspaper that was supposedly written by the members. In it, he wrote that they claimed responsibility of the murders to get rid of lewd women. While the police may have initially brushed the letter off, they did eventually find a note at a crime scene placed in a victim's mouth in the same handwriting signed by the Patriots of Vitebsk. Over time, the investigation began to narrow down, with the list of owners of small red cars becoming smaller, and through records upon records to find a link. Ignatovich found a break when visiting a firm where motorized vehicles were repaired. He checked the handwriting of the letters to that of the employees, and on a receipt, he found a match belonging to Gennady Mikhazevich. Mikhazevich seemed an ordinary man, born in 1947 at the village of Ist in the Vitebsk region, and raised by an alcoholic father who was violent towards his mother. Outwardly, he was a good worker, caring father, and did not drink. He was a member of the Communist Party and was even chosen to be secretary of the local committee. His involvement in the voluntary people's Druzina was actually one of his greatest tools in escaping capture, and one of the reasons why he was always a step ahead or clear of the police. After coming home from a stint in the mandatory army service, Mikhazovich had discovered his girlfriend had left him and married another man which he claims led him to suicidal thoughts. On the first night of his murder, he set out to see his parents, who lived in the village of Politsk. He was attending a technical college and living in Vitebsk at the time. He had intended to catch the bus, but was too late, so he set off on foot, carrying these supposed thoughts of suicide. He met a woman on the road and decided to take his anger out on the woman rather than himself. This event would set him off on his new murderous path, as he killed again later that year and twice the next year. In the early murders, Mikhazovich would rate in isolated spots for women, or he would drive his red Zaporozhet, cruising the roads looking for victims. As Keller states in Murder by Numbers, none of the women ever refused to get into his car. In a backwater like Ist, a ride in a motor vehicle was a real treat. Mikhazovich was part of the local voluntary police force, and he was eager to help in the investigation. He became paranoid when the investigation began closing down on people driving red cars. He even held up suspected red cars interrogating drivers. After murdering and raping the victims, he would rob them of money and valuables 
before tossing their bodies on the side of the roads. He would also take his souvenir from the murder, like many of the serial killers. The investigation did not curb the killings. With his inside knowledge, he was able to learn how the investigation was being conducted and the methods used. He was finally arrested 14 years after his first murder, on December 9th, 1985. Mikhazovich ultimately confessed to the killings. He led police to his trophies and victims' belongings. Some of the items he even gave to his wife as gifts. Apparently, in a truly sacrilege act, he melted down wedding rings from the victims and used them to make dental fillings and crowns for his wife. Mikhazovich was sentenced to death and executed by firing squad in 1987. Those who were convicted had varying outcomes, ranging from imprisonment and in some cases, execution. If you like to support the channel, you can do so on Patreon. You'll get stickers, merch, credit, special access to our Discord server, and you can even become a producer of the channel. Special thanks to everyone who checks out anything that Midrealm does. I appreciate it.